What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about Refused, a band that is basically single-handedly responsible for completely transforming the way that the world looks at the entire genre of punk and hardcore. I am sad to say that, unfortunately, I am old enough to have been listening to punk for over 30 years now, and in that time, I've seen it go from a genre that was basically sneered and looked down on or just completely ignored by the media and music critics because they kind of saw it as this genre that was just there for meatheads to go beat each other up. Whereas now it's taken seriously as an art form and quote unquote real music and respected by everybody from Pitchfork to Brooklyn Vegan to Rolling Stone. All those media outlets and gatekeepers that back when I was a kid wouldn't touch this stuff with a 10 foot pole. And for better or worse, Refused is the one band that maybe more than anybody else played a key role in that transition, essentially legitimizing hardcore in the eyes of the musical establishment. So how did they do it? Despite being active for really only about five or six years in their prime and breaking up before really anybody ever cared about them. And most importantly, what is their lasting impact and legacy on the world of punk, hardcore, and metal? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. But first, if you haven't, please check me out on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week from 4 to 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And there's a link to that in the description of this video. Refuse started way back in 1991 in Umea, Sweden. Apologies if I'm saying that wrong. The Swedes love to correct me on that, which is a college town that, from what I understand, is relatively small, but has somehow produced a disproportionate amount of really great bands over the years. Most notably, aside from Infused, would be Mashuga. After a few years of kind of grinding it out, playing local shows, Refused released their first album called This Just Might Be The Truth in 1994. <laughs> And if your introduction to Refused was The Shape of Punk to Come, you might be very surprised by this album because it's basically their attempt at copying the American style of Victory Records metallic hardcore that was popular at the time, for example, like Unbroken, Earth Crisis, and Integrity. And for a little context here to understand how unlikely it was that this band ever got on the radar in America, at that time, the European punk and hardcore scene had basically zero currency in America outside of, you know, the classic 80s bands like The Exploited and Discharge and whatnot. So the idea of a Swedish punk band making it over here at all, let alone having any kind of larger impact, was very, very hard to imagine. This was, I think, in large part because this is before the internet as we knew it. So there was honestly just like no way to even know that this stuff was happening. Unless you were like very, very, very plugged into the international underground scene, which very few people were. I first heard them on a compilation that Burning Heart records put out in 1995, which I somehow stumbled upon. I would imagine a few Americans may have heard them from that as well, but their real breakthrough was in 1996 when they released their second album, Songs to Fan the Flames of Discontent on Victory Records. And you may know Victory Records for putting out bands like Hawthorne Heights, A Day to Remember, and Atreyu in the 2000s. But before all that, back in the mid 90s, they were by far the biggest and most important label in hardcore with bands like Earth Crisis, Snapcase, and Strife. So for them to sign Refused and also another Swedish hardcore band called Donuts was a huge sign of credibility that really put Swedish hardcore on the map. With that being said, both of those bands, at least at that time, were more or less just doing their version of the American style of metallic hardcore, like the bands I mentioned. So most people just kind of looked at them as like these Europeans that were sort of a few years behind what the Americans were doing. The same way we looked at other Swedish bands like Mill and Colin as sort of their version of Bad Religion or No Effects. And some people might point to Refused's political lyrics as something new and groundbreaking. But again, that was definitely not something new to hardcore either. Bands like Struggle, Vegan Reich, and Chokehold, among many other 
others had covered a lot of very similar territory in the 90s hardcore scene as well. And if it seems like I'm being a little bit critical of the band so far, that is not my intent. My point is that up until this point, they were essentially a perfectly fine mid 90s hardcore band, but really not much more than that, which is what made their next album, The Shape of Punk to Come in 1998, all the more shocking and impactful. And before we talk about The Shape of Punk to Come, I want to give a little bit of context to explain why it was such an important groundbreaking album that changed so many things, because I think it's pretty hard to understand it without having that context. The first thing to understand is that punk and hardcore are not the same thing. If you're not into the scene, this might seem like splitting hairs, but honestly, it really is a huge difference. In the mid to late 90s, punk was bands like No Effects, Rancid, Green Day, and The Offspring. Musically, much more accessible and melodic than hardcore, and the culture of punk was basically the kind of people that you might see hanging out at like a Zoomies or Pac Sun store at the mall. Basically, you know, like fairly normal suburban kids that wanted something a little bit more aggressive than Backstreet Boys or whatever, but nothing too crazy, and they generally weren't like total fuck ups. But in the 90s, hardcore was something very, very different. For one, hardcore was way more aggressive musically, with bands like Disembodied tuning down to G or whatever, and just getting ridiculously, ridiculously heavy. The same was true of hardcore lyrics. These were not songs about like the girl at school rejecting you or cops kicking you out of a skate spot or whatever with bands like Chokehold and Earth Crisis, getting into things like radical ecology, indigenous rights, rejecting patriarchy, and a lot of other topics that are kind of trendy and woke now. But back then they were honestly groundbreaking. There were even people in the scene that were getting into direct action, doing things like burning down animal testing labs, like people literally going to federal prison for eco-terrorism. 90s hardcore was honestly some pretty wild shit. But despite all of that, absolutely nobody in, I guess what you could call like the mainstream music media was giving any attention at all to hardcore on a musical level. Spin, Rolling Stone, MTV, even all those like alternative weekly newspapers that you see in every city, like we had The Stranger in Seattle. Not a single one of them took hardcore seriously at all or gave it any attention whatsoever. At best, all you could hope for was maybe a paragraph here and there in Metal Maniacs. And as far as overall media attention goes, there were a handful of like TV news spots and stuff about hardcore, but they focused on the supposed violence in the scene, which on the one hand, they would kind of exaggerate and blow out of proportion. But to be fair, was honestly out of control in places like Salt Lake City. After a six month investigation, Reno police are calling the so-called straight edgers a gang. And for good reason, they've been accused of enforcing their opposition to smoking and drinking by force. How ridiculous is that? Sometimes assaulting those who break their rules with pepper spray or brass knuckles. The cops say some of them are so determined to prove their point that they've allegedly even committed kidnapping or worse. And so you put all of that together, and I think specifically kind of the Victory Records branch of hardcore that refused kind of loosely belong to, mostly just because they were on that label and kind of sort of sounded like a lot of those bands. I think by the late 90s, that scene was something that the band just no longer wanted to have anything to do with. Refused were kind of this like political leftist sort of band that maybe kind of sort of sounded like it, but really just didn't fit in at all. That branch of hardcore had become synonymous with guys in basketball jerseys and Jankos, starting bands that played these basically crappy rehashed versions of Earth Crisis riffs, and were mostly concerned with impressing each other with their cool dance moves in the pit. And I personally liked a lot of those victory type hardcore bands because I'm an asshole, (laughs) but it was definitely getting pretty played out. And I think that whole like spin kicks and basketball jerseys thing was just not something Refused wanted to be part of at all. We toured in the States and we were in Victory Records. So these hardcore jocks came out to our shows. We talked about gay rights and we talked about the the destruction of capitalism. We talked about feminism. and, And a lot of people in that scene wasn't interested in politics. They were just interested in kind of the beatdown and the heavy music, but then slightly conservative in the way they were thinking. And so they had to look in the mirror and say, what do we do from here? We're basically part of this scene that we have kind of grown to hate. What do we do? 
And so they decided to make something that was just completely different from what anybody expected from them and give the hardcore scene a collective middle finger in the process, consciously rejecting everything that the 90s hardcore scene had become. As all subcultures and, and youth movements have a tendency to be quite rigid in how they approach things. We were never that rigid people. We were always too adventurous. And uh, we did shape a punk to come in many ways as a protest against what we felt like like was uh, the conservative idea of what punk and hardcore should be. And starting with just the title of the album, you could tell that they were coming from a very different place than pretty much any other band in the scene. The title is a reference to Ornette Coleman's classic jazz album from 1959 called The Shape of Jazz to Come, which was a revolutionary album that kind of freaked everybody out and turned jazz on its head. And so they were basically saying with this album, we want to do the same thing, but for hardcore and punk. And musically, the album was definitely still rooted in hardcore, but not so much that Earth Crisis, Integrity, Basketball Jersey kind of sound that they were drawing from in their early albums. This album definitely did still have some of that, but what I hear is a lot of influence from the San Diego emo scene. This was a much less mainstream, kind of obscure sub, sub, sub genre of hardcore that you couldn't find at any store at the mall. This was all just DIY releases that you had to get through the mail or buy at a show. And it had been going on for a while in 1998, but unless you really kind of knew about the underground, it was off your radar. For example, bands like Heroin, Swing Kids, and Portraits of Past. As an example of what I'm talking about, listen to The Deadly Rhythm by Refused. And compare that to this song by Antioch Arrow. And the same thing extended to their aesthetic. Whereas in the early years of the band, they were doing the baggy pants thing. Starting with this album, they looked more like bands like Nation of Ulysses and Swing Kids, who really consciously rejected the basketball jersey thing and dressed more like indie kids with their dyed black Spock hair, white belts, and tight high water pants. And for the maybe few thousand people who knew about these bands and the kind of San Diego influenced scene, this wasn't necessarily a new thing, but to the victory audience who were still wearing Nikes and moshing to Earth Crisis, this look and sound was totally shocking and new. But I want to be clear, I'm not just saying that they were a knockoff of the San Diego bands by any means, because number one, I think their songs were just honestly better than any of those bands, and it's not even close. But they were also so much more than just that. This album combined hardcore and punk with other genres like jazz, ambient, and kind of like electronic elements in ways that were very, very fresh and new. For example, that little break in new noise that always reminded me of the Metal Gear Solid sneaking music. And because this album came out in America on Epitaph Records, the same label as Rancid, The Offspring, and Bad Religion, it reached an audience of people who had never heard or seen anything remotely like this. I think this YouTube comment really describes that dynamic perfectly. Man, I remember listening to mostly no effects, Pennywise, stuff of that sort of skate punk vibe, and then I found this album by happen chance in my brother's music collection, and this shit changed my life. But unfortunately, as is oftentimes the case, with things that are ahead of the curve. At the time, basically nobody gave a shit about this album. It sold less than 1,500 copies in its entire first year that it was out. And the people who did hear the album mostly didn't like it because they were expecting, you know, your typical Victory Records meathead hardcore and obviously got something very, very different than that. And so the band was in a very bad place in 1998. The album bombed, the guys in the band hated each other and they were at each other's throats all the time. And it was just too much to keep it together. And so they played their last show to less than 100 people in some random basement in Harrisonburg, Virginia. This song, it's the last one. It's been fucking awesome to be here. And so that was that for Refused. As the saying goes, they went out not with a bang, but with a whimper. For as much as they had wanted to make this like big grand statement with the shape of punk to come and change the scene, it basically went unheard and made no impact. Or so they thought. Slowly but surely, word of mouth took effect. People heard the album. They thought it was amazing. They told their friend about it. It sort of started to snowball. And it ended up selling over 20,000 copies in 
the next year, eventually selling over 180,000 copies, which is a huge amount for a 90s hardcore band that kind of deliberately set out to make this really antagonistic, difficult album. And since then, it's become regarded as one of the all-time classics in the genre, with iconic bands like Rage Against the Machine, The Yeah Yeah Yeahs, and Linkin Park, among many others, citing it as a primary influence. As a few examples, Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses called it the Sgt. Peppers of punk. Kirk Hammett of Metallica said that his jaw literally dropped when he saw the video for New Noise. And Paramore even borrowed some of their lyrics in their song Born For This. Although my personal favorite example of just how far their influence reached is when Crazy Town, you know, the band that did Butterfly, covered New Noise. Yes, that happened. And there are plenty of other bands that didn't literally cover Refused, but borrowed from them so closely that they might as well have. Which brings us to the question of what exactly is their lasting impact and legacy? Aside from the literally hundreds, if not thousands of well-known bands who would list Refused as an influence, to me, their legacy is that they put hardcore on the map with a whole group of people who had never given the genre at the time of day. Namely, music critics, journalists, those kind of people. Basically, they made hipsters respect hardcore. And there is maybe no better example of that than when they were finally persuaded to come together to do a reunion show on the main stage of Coachella 2012, which they were able to get $500,000 for. Like who could have imagined paying a 90s hardcore band half a million dollars to get back together? All of those bands that we toured with in the 90s, none of those bands are ever going to be asked to play Coachella. And we became that band that was asked to play Coachella because of that record and the, the, the mythology around um, the breakup and, you know, no one got to see us play, you know. And whether that is good or bad is a matter of opinion. I would guess the band probably would agree with me on this. I would love to hear from any of them if they happen to be watching. On the one hand, it's cool to see Rolling Stone finally care about Black Flag and Bad Brains 30 years too late. On the other hand, that is kind of what frustrates me about it. Those type of people tend to basically ignore bands until they're broken up and it's too late. I would love to see them writing about current hardcore bands like Tsunami and Drain while they're actually still around, but you know, whatever. That's just kind of the nature of the beast, I think. And the last question to ask is, were they just full of shit? the whole time? It might sound rude, but I think it's a pretty obvious question, right? They would say the same thing. They're this anti-capitalist band making all these like grandiose statements about revolution and whatnot. And yet at the same time, they're taking hundreds of thousands of dollars to play to a bunch of rich, spoiled hipsters at Coachella. They also had songs and all these TV shows like Friday Night Lights. <laughs> They did a bunch of songs as the band Samurai in Cyberpunk 2077. So aren't they just full of shit? Well, on that point, I will let you decide for yourself, but personally, I don't really see things that way. I think it's about compromises. Sure, you could stay just completely ideologically pure and never play shows outside the basement of some vegan punk house and only distribute your music on hand copied cassettes or whatever. But if you really believe in your message, why would you do that? To me, it's kind of the same thing as bands like Rage Against the Machine. If you have something truly important to say, I think you owe it to yourself and the world to say it on the biggest platform that you possibly can, even if that means making a few compromises along the way. Which, to be honest, is why I make videos about Mudvayne and Slipknot, because I hope that somebody watching those videos will look at all these flyers on the wall behind me and maybe go look up some of these bands or watch my videos about Earth Crisis, Shelter, and yes, Refused. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my podcasts and videos a week early. There are members only channels in my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways and there is a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.